Coming to you live from the Splat Zone Towers, this is the Splat Zones. Welcome back to the Splat Zones. We are a monthly video cast slash podcast where we bring you the best Nintendo related topics. I am your host, Nice1983, and joining me is the hardest working co host in podcasting, Mario After Party. Yeah. All right, guys. So this is an episode that I've actually been thinking about since September, which is when we did our first episode of the Splat Zones. Uh, it's one that I knew we'd have to do before, you know, a 12-month time period had ended. And uh, I only put it on hold because I wanted to actually save it for the new year because I look forward to the future of this franchise. So I want to wait till we got into the future. So we're here now. So this episode is going to be our Super Mario Brothers. 30th anniversary special. We will discuss the history of the Nintendo icon as well as sharing some of our special Mario memories. But before we get into all that, we got to get into our first segment, our newly minted Nintendo News Report. So we got some cool stories this month, bro. Our first story is the Nintendo World Store revision. Uh, The Nintendo World Store is Nintendo's flagship Nintendo shop located at the Rockefeller Center in New York City. It's going to close its doors on January 19th, and it will be closed until February 19th. They're going to undergo some revisions. Uh, When they reopen, the store will be having the new tagline, where everyone comes to play. The specialty shop opened its doors originally on May 14th, 2005, but before that, the location was originally Pokemon Center USA. This is the second remodeling of the store in its current form, and upon its reopening, the store will be rebranded as Pokemon and Y. I'm sorry, Nintendo and Y. I like this story because it actually kind of leads me to believe that Nintendo is open to opening more stores across the country. Uh, the That store stood the test of time. It's successful. But the fact that they're rebranding the store as Nintendo and Y makes me think that we might get a, a Nintendo FL or a Nintendo GA or a Nintendo TX for all the, you know, a different Nintendo store in every state. That's kind of exciting to me because it's kind of hard to find places where you can just go and exclusively have a Nintendo experience. So I think that's kind of cool. Uh, I think you're going to like this next story, bro. Our second story is that there will be two manga series based off the Splatoon franchise. Uh, they'll be in the weekly Famitsu magazine. Uh, The first one will be written by Kino Takahashi, and that will be called Hono Bono Ika for Koma. And the second one's going to be called Play Manga. Uh, Play Manga will feature different mangaka and an anthology style work. And uh, this actually marks the second uh, collaboration with Splatoon and manga, as uh, last year they were in the Squid Girl manga. Uh, And for those who don't know, Famitsu is a video game magazine in Japan that comes out in both weekly and monthly forms. The cool thing about this announcement is it comes hot on the heels of Nintendo's new president, uh, Kimishima, stating that uh, the Splatoon franchise could be extended possibly as far as Super Mario Brothers. Uh, That's interesting. Um, Also, Kimishima has stated that uh, he wants to, you know, branch out with Nintendo um, to more than just to mobile gaming. He's also talking about you know, manga and anime as well. So that could, or movies and anime, excuse me. So that could mean, uh, you know, even a Splatoon anime as well, maybe down the line. Yeah, I could see how that would work. Um, Even though Splatoon's story mode isn't all that in depth, I feel like you could do, you could expand upon the story mode using, you know, different forms of media. So I think that is honestly a really good way to go for them. Well, I mean, the movie part kind of makes me nervous just because, you know, Nintendo's movies in the past have been pretty horrible. But, you know, maybe, uh, especially now that you see uh, companies like Marvel taking control of their um, IPs and, and creating their own studios, maybe Nintendo will take a little more control in trying to make a movie with one of their IPs that actually, um, you know, does it justice. I concur. There's there's no way about it. And the last 
news segment uh, story for the month of January. Now this this one is so exciting to me. The Pokemon Company unveils its 20th anniversary plans. To commemorate the game's historic anniversary, the company has detailed a number of plans in the immediate future. First, all the existing Pokemon ami Amiibo will be restocked so that hard-to-find Jigglypuff will be in everyone's collection. Uh, GameStop will be holding monthly mystical Pokemon distributions. So all the mystical Pokemon, mythical Pokemon from Mew all the way down to, uh, what is it, Volcanion, the newest one that's coming out, will all be distributed through GameStop uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, they haven't detailed when that's going to start, but this is the first time since Gen 5 that you can get a Mew. So it's been a little while. So it's going to be nice to go ahead and get that Pokemon added to the collection because I no longer own Gen 5, so I lost my Mew. All right. Pokemon, the Pokemon first 12 movies will be uh, digitally remastered and be released on iTunes, Google Play, and uh, Amazon digital distribution. So we're going to get new versions of those movies. It's going to be nice. Those, Especially that first Pokemon movie, hard to find. Uh, new Pokemon toys and clothing will be available on PokemonCenter.com. There is an exclusive new 3DS bundle that includes Pokemon Red and Blue and the cool little face plates on that smaller model. I like this one right here. Reprints of the original wave of the Pokemon trading card game. And that's going to go under the name of Pokemon Generations. All that goes in conjunction with Pokemon Go and Pokemon Tournament that will round out the year. The company, in an effort to keep the anniversary training, will be using the hashtag Pokemon20 to share Pokemon memories. And they're going to be changing the slogan from Gotta Catch Em All to Train On. And the last piece of information that they dropped on us is that the Pokemon company detailed that they have for the first time ever, they're going to make a live action Super Bowl commercial. That is a lot of stuff that the Pokemon company is going to be giving us this year. On top of maybe getting an announcement of Pokemon Z or a new Pokemon generation. It just seems like a matter of time before we get you know, more. But this is all exciting news. Uh, I think the only thing that's crazy to me is changing the slogan from Gotta Catch Them All to Train On. That that blows my mind. That's Coming from Gen 1 and, you know, following the franchise as long as I have, to change even the smallest thing sometimes can be hard to, like, accept. And I find it hard to accept. Yeah, but... Go ahead. I mean, you look at other companies, they, um, they change their slogans all the time. I mean, Gotta Catch Them All was a... Uh... You know, it was per the perfect slogan. It was genius marketing, but I think it's time. You know, Pokemon's been around for, you know, almost 20 years now. So I think it's time to, you know, change the slogan, make it a little bit fresh. And you know what we say here, you got to stay fresh. Right, stay fresh. So Pokemon's trying to stay fresh too. All right. So guys, that is our Nintendo news report. So let's go ahead and move on to the next segment of the show. And that's what are we playing and amiibo acquisitions. Right now, I'm all about that Triforce Heroes. And I've been getting back into Bayonetta a little bit, as well as Shovel Knight. Those three games, especially Shovel Knight right now, such a good game. It was my game of the year for 2014. Replaying it again, and it's awesome. And to go with that, I got myself that nice, brand new Shovel Knight amiibo. So I can unlock the two-player co-op and the custom night. And all that is super fun in conjunction. I was playing it with my brother. And we were just going through that game. And it was a lot of fun. So, yeah. The only amiibo I've gotten this month is uh, Shovel Knight. What about you, Mario After Party? Man, I don't have a lot of news on my end. I haven't played any games. And I haven't um, bought any amiibos. The only game I've been playing um, from time to time since I've come back from... Um, Christmas break was uh, Hearthstone, so I, I haven't played anything. Hey, games again. All right, so short segment for the Amiibo acquisitions and what are we playing, but that's okay. That gives us more time to get into our topic of the month. And our topic of the month, as I said, is our Super Mario Brothers 30th anniversary special. Mario is an icon. 
I mean, if you think about the games that he's been in, Mario actually even transcends those games. We've had movies. Not saying they're good movies, but we've had movies. We've had multiple TV shows, a plethora of games, clothing, toys, Amiibo. Anything that you can brand, Mario has actually been on. Cereal. Soda. Mario is an icon. He transcends gaming. So with that, we wanted to go ahead and celebrate that character and that franchise. But the only way to, to go into this is to go back. So what we're going to do is we're going to take you back. We're going back to 1981. We're calling this the arcade era. Back in 1981, the very first game developed by Shigeru Miyamoto was Donkey Kong. Donkey Kong was developed by him and it was initially supposed to be a licensed game about Popeye. Things didn't plan out. So what he had to do was go ahead and create something new. Basically using the, the archetypes from the Popeye franchise, he created three characters. Jumpman, Lady, and Donkey Kong, the titular character. By the time the game came to America, those names weren't going to stick. So, Nintendo of America decided that we had to do some changing. Specifically, the name Jumpman. Jumpman was the name that the Japanese used because it was similar to Walkman and Pac-Man. It wasn't going to stick in America. So, based off of their landlord, Mario Sigali, that's where Mario gets his name. Donkey Kong's name, already great. And Lady became Pauline. No specific story behind that. Uh, Jumpman was the central hero of the game, despite the game actually being named after the secondary character. Uh, Donkey Kong marks the first time in video game history that a storyline is told in game form. Before that, games didn't have a very specific story. It was either blast this, shoot that, you know, destroy this, all that. So Mario, I'm sorry, Donkey Kong marks the first time that you get stories in games. I played the Donkey Kong arcade game. It's, I, it was um, pretty good, actually. I played it when I was about 11 or 12, and I just remember being surprised <clears throat> that I even found that game because it was in some like lobby of uh, a condominium complex somewhere in St. Pete, I think. And uh, I just remember seeing that, and I was like, really? This is this is what it looked like? But See, my first experience with Donkey Kong is actually at the NES port. Um, when I got my NES, I got a few games with it. Uh, Mario and Duck Hunt in a two-pack, and Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. in a two-pack. Um, so my first experience playing Donkey Kong was that NES version, which is a... It's kind of a neutered version of the game. Uh, limiting, it's just four stages. Like, it doesn't have, like, all the screens that the arcade version has. Still, man, like... It's that game is notoriously difficult, very hard. It's you're not very, there's you know the majority of people who actually play that game probably won't get past the second or third screen. It's hard, and it requires a lot of timing, precision. You have to be invested in this game. This game was such a commercial success that within two years of its release, it made two hundred and eighty million dollars in quarters. $280 million in quarters. That's pretty spectacular. Uh, a lot of quarters. Oh, man. And the game was so popular that it actually had a cartoon segment in the Saturday morning cartoons uh, TV show, Super uh, Saturday Supercade. The game was a phenomenon. Donkey Kong was everywhere. And with that, Jumpman was everywhere. So we go ahead and we move over to 1982. And what we get is a sequel, a direct sequel to Donkey Kong in Donkey Kong Jr. Uh, it continues the narrative from the first game. Uh, Mario has taken Donkey Kong, placed him in a cage as a punishment for the events of the first game. This is the first time in Nintendo's history that Mario actually plays a villain. 
It might actually be the last time, too. Mario is not playable. He's a stationary uh, NPC who just throws monsters at you. Uh, this game was not as popular as the predecessor, but it did also have its own Saturday morning cartoon se segment replacing the Donkey Kong segment of the Saturday Supercade. Uh, you can find them on YouTube. They're super cheesy. I'll try to link some videos in the uh, in our video. Donkey Kong Jr. though is the only Donkey Kong game that isn't a country game that I've beaten because it only had four screens. They uh, this is around the time where they started making their games a little bit more friendly to the the fan base. Donkey Kong notoriously hard. Donkey Kong Jr. was a step down. Still, this game to me was a lot of fun. Uh, Love the characters, and it's it's very odd seeing Mario in that villain role because it's you know it's Mario. We don't he's not supposed to be the villain. This takes us to 1983, and that's with the original Mario Brothers. This game does a lot of establishing for the character. This is where Mario steps into his own, and starts becoming the icon we know him as. In the original Donkey Kong game, Mario was a carpenter. By, by the time Mario Brothers rolls around, he's changed to a plumber to better fit the game motif. If you've played the original Mario Brothers game, uh, you it's a three level stage, there's pow blocks, and you have to run up the stage and hit you know the enemies from below, jump up top and kick them dead. Um, this game also establishes that Mario is a native New Yorker. First time we get that, and that's to better fit the motif of the game because the game has pipes running through the walls. And Miyamoto thought that the sewer infrastructure of New York was probably the best in the world. So he decided that that's where Mario's home base would be. So we get that. We get Mario being from New York and Mario as a plumber. This game also marks the first appearance of Luigi. Or, uh, as he's known in Japan, R Ruiji, which actually means similar. And considering that Luigi was a pilot swap, the name Ruiji would definitely stick. This is our first appearance of PAL blocks, which show up in a numerous amount of uh, other Mario games. This game features two-player competitive co-op. It's a weird thing to say, competitive co-op. Um... This game did, was mildly popular, but it didn't do that well because it was released in 1983. And for you histo game historians, you all know that that's when the, uh, the video game market crashed. So this game would be considered a mainstream failure just due to that era. What I like about this game is that it shows up in Mario Brothers 3. If you're on the overworld map and you go to the start, if you're playing two players, if you go back to the start button, you actually enter this mini game and you can battle it out. Uh, me and my brother actually did that a lot uh, when Mario 3 was out. All right, so that's it for the arcade era. Not a lot, but we do have our introduction to some key characters. We got Donkey Kong, we've got Mario, we got Luigi. You know, and we've got some establishing done. That brings us to 1985 with the release of the Nintendo Entertainment System or the NES and Mario Super Mario Brothers as our launch title there is a lot to say about this game this game is as perfect of a launch title as you can possibly get but let's run into some of the specifics obviously this is the first appearance of Mario on the NES this is our first introduction to the Mushroom Kingdom and its residents Princess Toadstool or Peach as she's known now, we get Toad, our first appearance of Koopa, first introduction of some of the minor villains, Goombas, Koopa Troopas, Bloopers, Cheep Cheeps, first introduction to power-ups. This is what makes Mario super. We got some great power-ups. You got your 1-Up, your Star Man, your Super Mushroom, and your Fire Flower that round things out. Fun, little known fact, this is the best-selling game of all time until Wii Sports was released. This game literally set the tone for everything that was to come with this franchise. Um, I have some great memories. I remember when I got this game, my, uh, 
My brother was born in 1989. I had played NES games at a friend's house before. But, you know, my parents wanted me to, like... They, you know, they knew they were going to be taking care of my brother because he was just born. He's a newborn. And newborns require a lot of attention. So they wanted to keep me entertained some way. So they got me the NES. And I remember plugging that system in, playing Mario for the first time, and, like, being utterly blown away by that game. I mean, blown away. It was colorful. The music was catchy. Buttons intuitive. The play game, the play style... It's all like, it's like a bombardment to your senses, your visual senses, but it's great. And it required so much dedication to play that game. No save feature, man. No save feature. That game requires patience, dedication, timing. It is one of the best games of all time, in my opinion. Yep, that was the first video game I ever played. Um, I, I was just <clears throat> in kindergarten when I first played that game, and... Uh, I remember that I saved up all my birthday money and everything for a whole year. So when I got to first grade, I bought a Nintendo with my own money. And thus, a gamer was born. <laughs> so much to say. So this brings us to uh, some confusing times. Super Mario Bros. 2. Super Mario Bros. 2 is... Two separate games. You have Super Mario Bros. 2, or as America, it's known as the Lost Levels. And you have Super Mario Bros. 2, which in Japan is known as Super Mario Bros. USA. This marks the first time there are two completely separate versions of a Mario game. Uh, the Lost Levels is the first Mario game on the Famicom Disk System, which was a floppy disk drive attachment to the NES, where you would go to, like, I guess the Japanese equivalent of Blockbuster, load your disc in there and every month they would update the, the information on your floppy disk and you'd have like new stages for this game. Very interesting way. They actually thought that this was going to kill the NES. It never came out in America. Um... This, this disc system, it's it's a super weird idea that Nintendo had. I could not imagine this working, but it's kind of like 1980s DLC. I was just going to say, it's like, it was like the the, uh, the very beginning of DLC. When yeah. DLC was in its infancy. That's interesting. Another game that came out this way was the original Legend of Zelda. was also released on this Famicom disc system. They managed to figure out how to port it so that it could be played on American consoles. Um, this actually contributes to the reason why Zelda does not do well in Japan. Uh, because their introduction to, to Zelda wasn't a friendly one. They had to keep going back to get new stages. So it didn't work in the, you know, the Japanese's favor. But that's how that works. The Lost Levels um, is a... Very similar game to the original Mario Brothers. Um, visually, they're almost identical. The difference is, is that the Lost Levels is much more difficult than the original. Um, the stage design is harder. Jumps are harder. Mario can jump to the point where he's off of the screen and you don't know where he's going to land. It's, it's a brutal game. Um, it also introduces us to a power-up uh, known as the Poison Mushroom, which will kill you... If you're small, and if you're Super Mario, it will turn you back into regular Mario. I played this game when they released it on the Super NES on the Super Mario All-Stars. And when I got that Poison Mushroom, I think that's the first time I said a curse word. Because I touched that stupid Poison Mushroom, and I said, damn it! And my mom said, what? I said, nothing. Poison Mushroom. Alright, so... Nintendo Japan was really happy with the way the game came out, and they were ready to extend the Mario franchise in America. So they sent it to Nintendo of America, and the game master, Howard Phillips, if you don't know who that is, kids, you need to look him up. Nintendo used to have a title called Game Master, and this guy was like the original video game tester. And he had a good eye for video game design. 
he basically, if he played it and he approved of it, that was ga- that game was going to be a hit. He played this game and was so frustrated by the difficulty that he went to the president of Nintendo of America and told him to tell Nintendo of Japan that the game is too hard and will frustrate American children. So he reports that to Nintendo of Japan. Nintendo of Japan gets scared. They're like, oh no, we just entered the home console market. We're trying to revive the home console market. If American children aren't into this game, we're, we're done. So they had a few months before they had announced that they were actually going to release the game in America. So what they did was they took an older game and reskinned it to be Super Mario Bros. USA, or as we know it as Super Mario Bros. 2. The game was called Doki Doki Panic, and it was made as a one-off game by Nintendo for a TV station in Japan. They just reskinned it, but what we get in this game is this introduces us to the world of Subcon uh, and the pe- you know the red in- the residents of Subcon. We get our first appearance of the villain War, Shy Guys, Fry Guys, Mouser, and Birdo. We get all those characters. This is our first playable appearance of Peach and Toad. Uh, and each character has specific attributes. Uh, Peach floats. Mario is the most balanced. Luigi is the best jumper and Toad is the strongest. We also get introduced to throwing mechanics and lifting mechanics, which we've never had in any Mario game. We have a heart meter. And this is the first time Luigi is actually portrayed as taller than Mario. Um, Mario USA or Mario Brothers 2, this was a weird game. Um, Even as a kid, I thought this was a weird game. I was like, it's Mario but it doesn't feel like Mario. Like, a lot of the mechanics are similar. A lot of, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but it's so odd. And the weird Egyptian setting of the game was, it just threw me for a loop because, you know, in the Mushroom, you know, the Mushroom Kingdom was so colorful and the world of Subcon is so dark by comparison. Well, Mario 3 has a similar setting, an Egyptian setting with the pyramids and the desert. Yeah, but the whole world of Subcon is essentially like this weird desert. Oh, this is the first Mario game that has a vertical scrolling as well. So you would, you know, the levels don't just don't go horizontally. We have vertical climbs that you have to do to complete certain stages. Different game, but uh, it was a success in America. Reskinning this game proved to actually really help the franchise. Uh, American consumers ended up thinking that the Mario franchise was a lot more versatile. Uh, around this time, we got the first Super Mario Brothers TV show, uh, the Super Mario Brothers Super Show, and that used a lot of elements from the second game. Um, a lot of the settings are the same in that show. A lot of the uh, villains that show up in that show are specifically from Mario Brothers 2 or Mario Brothers USA. Ironically, we wouldn't see the release of Super Mario Bros. 2 Lost Levels until the SNES uh, in the Mario All-Stars package, which was a send-away if you bought an SNES. So, it gets a little quiet for a while, and then we get to uh, 1990, and this is the big one, Super Mario Bros. 3. There is so much to do in this game. There is so much stuff and there's a lot of new stuff we get our first overworld map in this game we get the introduction to the koopa kids all eight of them first mario game where we have sub bosses uh new kingdoms within the mushroom kingdom uh previously it had pretty much we all pretty much thought that princess toadstool was the only you know form of royalty in that world they showed multiple kingdoms but I think the thing that you have to talk about most when it comes to Mario Brothers 3 are the power-ups. There are so many. Raccoon Tail, uh, Tanuki Suit, Frog Suit, Hammer Bros Suit, uh, the Karibo Shoe or the Goomba Shoe, uh, the Power Whistle that 
let you skip entire worlds. The only time I've actually beaten Mario Brothers 3, I used the whistle to get to the end of the game. That is legit. Me too. Me too. <clears throat> that is the only way I've beaten that game on the sole purpose is that no save features. No save features. It was brutal. Yep. Those games. Yeah. <sighs> and I still had to leave the, the console on overnight and wake up the next morning and beat it. And I didn't want to turn it off. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, dude, I have uh, I've burned out adapters by doing that. You know how hard it is to burn out an NES adapter? Yeah, that's I've never done that. That's yeah. actually pretty impressive that you've burned out an adapter. It was for Castlevania. It was for Castlevania that it happened. Um, well, out of all those games, though, um, you know, as many hours as I put into Mario 1 and 3, the most time I probably spent on a Mario game was with what you're going to talk about next, Super Mario Land for the Game Boy, just because it was portable. I took it everywhere I went. I literally played the heck out of that game. Every family road trip, every vacation, every time I went to visit relatives, I had that game. I, I played that game probably more than any other Mario game. Dude, Super Mario Land, this game is literally the perfect game to carry with you. Ironically, this is... I'm, I was actually kind of surprised. to I, I got this game when I got my Game Boy. I did get my Game Boy launch year, but I didn't realize that this game was a launch title. But this game, it was a launch title. It is the first Mario game not developed by Shigeru Miyamoto. That's crazy, considering how good that game actually is. Yeah, that's surprising, because it's it still maintains the Mario quality and the standard that we expect that I didn't know that it was not developed by Miyamoto. That's a really good game. Yeah, uh, this game introduces us to some weird things. Uh, we're not in the Mushroom Kingdom anymore. We're in Sarasa Land. Uh, we get to meet, uh, meet those characters. Our first introduction of Princess Daisy. Um, we get to, uh, our, we get weird, weird Fire Flower in this game. The weirdest version of the Fire Flower exists in this game where it like you can only shoot one at a time and it bounces everywhere. Like if you shoot it at a corner, it ricochets. First Mario game in the in the main series where you get to ride in vehicles. Uh the submarine and an airplane. I thought that was damn cool. Uh Koopa shells, if you don't get away from them, they explode and can kill you. Uh, and our introduction to the main villain, Tatanga, which is like a, uh, a Sphinx? Weird. So There you go with the Egypt theme. Yeah, we're coming back. I'm, I'm, I guess it's just a theme that I'm going to have to get used to in Mario games. Pretty prevalent, I guess. Alright. So, that's it for the NES and Game Boy era. I mean, there are more Mario games on the Game Boy, but none as standout as that original Mario Land. That takes us to 1991. And this little launch title here, Super Mario World, which is my favorite 2D Mario. This is our first 16-bit Mario. We are no longer in the Mushroom Kingdom. We're in Dinosaur Land. Our introduction of Yoshi, uh, new power-ups, and the first time Mario can do the spin jump. This game... I spent so many hours on this game. There were so many cool things. There was the Star World. Um, Yoshi. Just being able to have Yoshi added so many new elements to this game. Uh, Yoshi was a beast. Literally, I mean, you had he, if he, whatever color shells he ate determined what his abilities were. Super cool. Um, the Koopa Kids come back. Um, you get your baby Yoshis. Uh, the power-ups in this game. Not a lot of new ones, but you do have the feather and the cape. Mario had flown before, but Mario did not fly the way he flew up until this. I loved the cape. 
it was so much fun to fly up and then come crashing down and right before you hit the ground pull up and make him come back up in the air one of my favorite things to do in that game um super the game was it was like the first time i remember a mario game getting progressively difficult the further along you got um by the time you get to world eight it is it becomes difficult uh we get a much cleaner overworld system lots of bonus features there was a lot to do in that game. It was, You could spend hours on that game, and as a child, I, I completely did. So, this takes us to our first Mario spinoff, and one that will resonate in the Mario franchise for years to come. Super Mario Kart. Uh, this is our first official Mario spinoff. Mario had been in other games previously. Like He shows up in Punch-Out! as the referee. He shows up in tennis as like the line judge. Shows up in a bunch of games and weird cameos. It is super cool to... When this game came out, I was addicted to this game. I loved how fast it felt. I loved the way the sprites look. Um, the battle mode was one of my favorite things in this game. And this is the first time that power-ups are used as offensive items... In a different way, uh, like the star would, you know, you use that to crash into people and send them to hell. Um, you throw green and red shells, the bananas, the mushroom being a boost. Lots of cool things they did for this game. Um, and it originally was not going to be a Mario game. It was just going to be a two-player racer. They just... Nintendo has this weird idea that they build the game first and come up with the... The aesthetics later. Uh, this goes as far out as Splatoon. Splatoon was developed not about squids. It was just developed as a game that you shot and took territory. The squid idea came later. And initially they tried to use Mario. And Miyamoto gave that the thumbs down because he didn't want Mario to have a gun. And, you know, that evolved from there. Splatoon could have been a Mario game. Like... Weird irony there. And the last Mario game on the Super NES. This is a good one. We get to Super Mario RPG. Mario After Party. Tell me a little bit about Super Mario RPG. Um, it's one of my favorite RPGs of all time. It's the only Mario game to date with Bowser as an ally. And... It is also, I believe, the only Mario game developed by Square. Correct me if I'm wrong. It is developed by Square as their main developers with uh, Miyamoto as a uh, design assistant. Uh, he was literally only there to say that Mario can't do this and Mario can't do that. But uh, there is so much good about that game. Um, if you watched our top 10 video games of all time... We both had it on our list, and uh, there's just so much good uh, in that game. Uh, the story is spectacular. The battle system spectacular. And Mario After Party is right, man. Being able to play as Bowser, or even you know even have some kind of remote control of Bowser, it was good, and it was it was a different way to take the franchise, and it's one that you know we see stick later on. And that takes us to the N64. There's some great games in this era. Uh, the first one being a launch title. Super Mario 64. Uh, unfortunately, this is the game I probably have the least experience with. I played it. I didn't play it as religiously as a lot of other people. Um, but for what it is, it, it's a really well-designed game. We get some, you know, We get some brand new mechanics. Uh, include you know punching, kicking, uh, the butt stomp, the somersault, the backflips, and wall jumping. Uh, this game Mario is truly super in his standard form. Uh, we get some weird power ups. Uh, no mushrooms. Like we get like hat based power ups, like the the hat with the wings or the the metal Mario cap. Some weird weird uh, power ups in this game, but 
You know, it is considered one of the best games of all time. I personally wouldn't vote it there, but uh, there's a there there was a lot of fun in that game. It just, I think initially it was such a big departure for me that I just couldn't really get into it all that much. I didn't like it either. <clears throat> I didn't think it was that great, but you know, I didn't have a sixty four. I just played it at uh, other people's houses, and I mean, it was okay, I guess, but. Compared to the other Mario games um, that have come before and after, I just didn't particularly like that one. Yeah, yeah, I could, you know, there's, it's, to me, I mean, I know a lot of people want to say that that's a very pretty Mario game. I think the thing that really, uh, like, pushed me away is, I thought it was ugly. I thought it was an ugly I, Mario game. I agree. I thought it was ugly too. I mean, for the time, like, you knew that it was pushing, like, the best graphics that it has ever pushed, but it just looked ugly, in my opinion. I mean, that, I, that it's hard for me to, like, la you know, applaud that game. I'm gonna let Mario After Party talk about the next series in the, uh, that really lights up Mario's world. The Mario Party series, so, you got Mario's first party game, <clears throat> Mario Party 1, destroyed... Hands of children everywhere, um, yeah, including mine. Mine too. I mean, I, I know Nintendo issued gloves with people, but I never had a glove. I just had horribly disfigured hands until Mario Party 2 came out, and, uh, and it was all good from there. But, you know, I really uh, developed a love for party games. Um, you know, after that game came out, I really appreciated you know, all the different variations and the versions of Mario Party that came out after it, including the other party games um, on the Nintendo consoles as well. Oh, man, Mario Party. I have never... I mean, I'm, let's, let's talk about being teenagers. What, there are a lot of things that teenage boys do with their hands that this game prevented. Uh, this game really was a lot of fun, though. Um, some of the best mini games that you could play. And this is one of those games where you don't feel weird, you know, playing for hours on end. You, you would think that it's a game that you don't want to play for as long as you would actually play it. But man, when you finish one game, you always wanted to jump into another. This game was so much fun for me. Um... Yeah, Mario After Party's right. They destroyed hands, but man, they did get it way more right by the second iteration. Um, the next one, not so specifically Mario related, but 1999, Super Smash Bros. This game, uh, it set off a storm. One of the most popular fighting game franchises in recent memory. And... It literally takes its name from Super Mario Bros. I mean, there's only one word difference there. Uh, this is Mario's first appearance as a playable character in a fighting game. And this this game has gone on to spawn quite a franchise on its own. I mean, that was 1999 when this game came out. It is 2016. This game is this franchise is still strong. And uh, on a competitive level, it's only growing. Only growing. Yep, it's probably the most scrutinized Nintendo franchise as well. Oh yeah, um, it's it's so odd to see how like this how divisive this game, this franchise actually is, with with no really no one really being able to determine which is the best iteration. Uh, we get Paper Mario conceived as a sequel to Mario RPG. Uh, but due to Square's non-involvement in the game, it was changed to Paper Mario. That was a fun game for me. One of the best games of all time, in my opinion. GameCube. For the GameCube, we get the strangest Mario franchise game of them all in Luigi's Mansion. Uh, considering that this is the first Mario game on a new console, it it set a lot of people on... It pissed a lot of people off. There's no other way around it. Um... Everybody basically just thought it was Luigi Ghostbusters. By the time we get our first real Mario game, it's 2001 on this console. And that's uh, Super Mario Sunshine. 
And this game is also weird. Uh, taking a little bit of a, a page out of Luigi's Mansion book, we have to give Mario this weird backpack accessory. Uh, I remember when this game came out, a lot of people were pissed um, because it just didn't feel as fluid as maybe Mario 64 did. Um, I enjoyed this game much more than Mario 64. This game was brilliant to me. I like the flood mechanics, and I like having Yoshi back in a Mario game. Well, and now that Smash Bros. has taken that special from Mario Sunshine and used it in the game, so you can see the influence from that Super Mario Sunshine has had on the rest of the franchise because the whole fire hose thing is uh, still used in other games. Yeah. That, that game also is our first appearance of Bowser Jr., um, who's gone on to notoriety for himself. He's actually a pretty bomb-ass player in Smash Bros. We get to the Nintendo DS, and we get some weird games there. Um, a lot of emphasis was on the touchscreen initially. So our first Mario game is another Yoshi game. Um, and it's more of a tech demo that they released as a full-on game. Um, you basically control Yoshi with the touch pen. <clears throat> Pseudo-sequel to Super Mario World 2. Um, it's addictive in the way that uh, cell phone games are addictive. I'm actually surprised that this isn't a, a game announced for Nintendo's new mobile you know, development. The new Super Mario Bros. franchise uh, launches with this game. Uh, it's our reintroduction to Mario as a 2D platformer. We got some cool new power-ups like the mini mushroom that shrinks Mario. Probably the go. best game on the DS right here, though, is uh, Mario Kart DS. I remember spending hours playing this game online with you and cursing each other out and cursing out anybody who knew how to snake. Yep, it was a very important game to the DS. It definitely, if it, you know, didn't push the DS to um, handheld console domination, it definitely cemented it. It was a hugely popular game and... Um, really important for that system so I think it's one of the best-selling games on that system uh, but this game marks a milestone it's the first Mario Kart game to go online that's so important to where this franchise has gone um, every iteration since this game has had online and that's it for the DS era we get to the Wii era and I think this is where me and Mario After Party have some of our funniest stories uh, the first game, Mario game to come out, Mario Galaxy. First Mario game on the Wii. It's beautiful. Fully orchestrated game. This game is fully orchestrated, and it's stunning. And it's it's such a... In my mind, it was so beautiful. It was hard to believe that this was not on a high-definition console. This is one of the best-looking Mario games. Mario's in full 3D, and it it's actually beautiful. Some of the best stage design, character models... Everything about this game works. Uh, we also get the introduction of Rosalina and Luma, who will go on to notoriety in the most recent version of Smash. Now this game, me and Mario after party in this game, New Super Mario Bros. Wii. This is the first time that four player co-op is available in a Mario game. And let me tell you guys something, this game did not work in Mario Party after party's favor. I remember playing this game, me, my girlfriend at the time, Mario After Party, and my brother's wife. We are all playing this game in a room, and Mario After Party is running ahead of everybody, and he has to make a jump. I catch up to Mario After Party, jump on his head, and nearly kill him. He bubbles up, then my brother's wife comes, and she pops the bubble, Sending Mario after the party back down to his death. He bubbles up again. And my girlfriend at the time runs up. Pops Mario after party's bubble again. Finally sending him to his death. And all that came out of Mario after party's mouth was. Fuck you all. I have never. It was a dark time. <laughs> it was a dark time in the Mario franchise. <clears throat> Mario. New Super Mario Brothers Wii is tearing apart friendships, but... I laughed so hard at you that day, man. Uh, honestly, that was the most fun I've ever had playing a Mario game. Ever. 
I also remember beating that game with you. That was like one of the most intense final bosses I ever played. And it, it was, was. And after I beat that game, I never played it again. Yeah, yeah. We never. I I I put it down. I still have it. It's sitting there somewhere. I'm scared of it. Uh, we get into the 3DS era. We get Super Mario 3D Land. Um, first Mario game in, in stereoscopic 3D. Some cool little power-ups. The Tanuki suit makes its uh, long-awaited return. Uh, a month after that game comes out, Mario Kart 7. Which actually might be the best iteration of a Mario Kart game. And it's handheld. Uh, mm, I don't know. I don't think it had... For me, I think that... <clears throat> The DS version was better than the 3DS version, even though the 3DS was prettier. It didn't have the same quality of uh, tracks. Like the stage design wasn't as good in in those games. And that brings us to the Wii U era, which is where we currently sit. This brings us with uh, Super Mario 3D World. This is the first ever Mario game that's four-player co-op in a fully 3D realized world. Um, this game was a lot of fun. Uh, I play this game with my fiance now. Um, it is a lot of fun to play. It's it's addicting. The power ups are fun. Cat Mario is probably like the cutest version of Mario that has ever come into existence. A uh, lot of fun. Lots of crazy power ups in that game, like the double cherry for people who play uh, the single player mode. A lot of fun. One of the best rated Mario games in recent memory as well. And that brings us to 2015. 2015, we get uh, Super Mario Maker, which is probably the epitome of a Mario game, if I do say so myself. This game is absolutely brilliant in the way that it teaches you to build. It teaches you to build and create. Uh, there's a lot of fun to it. Uh, just this over the you know the holiday break, I challenged Mario after party to uh, to the Super Mario brother the Super Mario Maker challenge. I designed four amazing stages, brutal stages. Each stage was incre increasingly more difficult than the last, and I challenged him to beat it. How'd you do, bro? I beat all of them like a boss. Let's just say that uh, he had 47 lives when he uh, entered, and he left with 18. <laughs> I took it to him. Anybody who plays my stages, beware. Don't go through doors. Um, Don't follow the arrows either. <laughs> oh, man. This was a fun game. This... It's a well-conceived game, really. Uh, it 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 really takes you back. What, I, the first thing I noticed when playing Mario Maker was how much it reminded me of playing Mario Brothers for the first time. Like going back to that era where the game, where games were more about how a game played than like the best graphics that a system can output or the most hardcore story that a game can muster. This game, it's it's like, if this was the last Mario game to ever come out, it would be the way to end the franchise. It's, it's beautiful in every respect. Everything about this game is fun and, you know, it's, it's one of these games that can be played forever because... The fan, com the community, can continue to build stages, and make this game increasingly more fun. And uh, there's just a lot to this game, and there's a lot that says a lot about the character of Mario as a whole. And I think that's gonna where I'm gonna wrap up my closing thoughts for this episode. Um, where M Mar Super Mario Maker is the game that really takes us. And shows us how powerful this this icon is. He it shows us what Mario has meant to gaming in the thirty plus years of his existence. Um, the way the way I see it, current current video games could not exist without Mario, without 
this mascot without showing the world that video games aren't just for kids, they're for everyone. And uh, I think that's what I want everybody to take away from this is that Mario is, he, you know, Mario, Nintendo, they make games for everyone. And as long as they keep doing that, there will always be a Nintendo system in my house. And I think that's how I'm going to wrap up my closing thoughts for this episode. Mario After Party, what about you, bro? Um, <clears throat> no, I think you said it perfectly, you know. So, Mario has definitely um, been important to the video game industry for 30 years, and he's still important. That being said, there's a lot to look forward to in the future of the franchise. There's a lot. Um, we talked about this a little bit last episode, but there is going to be a Nintendo section at Universal Studios. I think that's a whole new way for people to fall in love with the character and uh, fall in love with Nintendo as a whole. So I, I just, you know, I look forward to where the character goes. Um, I want to see what the next thing is. I want to know, you know, be it on the Wii U or the NX or the 3DS. Let's see where the franchise goes. I mean, it hasn't really let us down before, so I'm, I don't believe that it's going to let us down ever. Guys... That's going to be it for this episode of uh, the Splat Zones. But before we let you go, I do want to announce the contest winner from back in October. Uh, we were supposed to get to it last month. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, Ryan James sent us his top 10 list. Uh, he won the Pokemon prize pack. Uh, I'm not going to read the top 10 list. We're going over a little bit. Uh, for this month, there will be another contest. And this is going to be for a Mario prize pack. So what I want you to do is go ahead and email us at uh, at the at our website or you know our YouTube. What is your favorite Mario memory? Go ahead, send that into us. We will make sure to absolutely read your memory on air, and you will receive an awesome Mario prize pack. Um, all that's left for us is to do is a. Uh, let me tell you the social media links, and we'll be out of your way, guys. Uh, you can always hit me up at nice one nine eight three on Twitter. You can email me at nice one 983 at gmail.com. You can hit me up on Facebook, facebook.com slash nice one nice nice one nine eight three game collecting. Go ahead and check out our website, nice one nine eight three dot wix wix dot com slash game collecting. And if you're a fan of the splat zones, go ahead, check out the rest of our episodes here on YouTube. You can hit us up on iTunes and download it. And you can find us on Stitcher Radio. That's it for this episode, guys. And you know how we like to end things here. Stay fresh! Stay fresh!